I also have no video for you. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to be on video here. Um, okay. So, hello everyone. We have uh, Lars Mapstead with us. Uh, he is a candidate for the presidential nomination of the Libertarian Party um, in 2024. Uh, we will be selecting our presidential candidate uh, this weekend uh, in Washington, D.C., and I'll actually be leaving in a uh, little over 12 hours to go to D.C. myself. Um, this will be streamed live on Twitch, and it will be posted to YouTube. The main reason for this is to post on YouTube, so I apologize in advance to the live Twitch chat um, where I will be paying less attention than my usual streams. Normally, I don't stream politics, but I stream other stuff such as chess. The reason that I'm doing this series of interviews, which I also did in 2020 uh, for the presidential candidates then, is I'm very involved with the Libertarian Party. Uh, and brief bit about my involvement, I served as vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee uh, 2006 to 2008. I started the Libertarian Party Facebook page, which now has 750,000 likes. Uh, and I helped elect... Uh, 250 libertarians to local office in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I don't just mean run, but but we actually elected 250 candidates that I recruited. Um, so I'm very interested in the success of the Libertarian Party. Uh, the way this interview will be conducted is I have a series of questions that I've asked all of the presidential candidates. This will not be a debate or a discussion or a back and forth. Uh, you all don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from the candidate. I'm going to ask the questions and then give the candidate uh, complete discretion in how he wants to answer and how long he wants to answer. So let's get into it. Uh, tell us about your background. Yeah, so I grew up really poor uh, in Big Sur, California, product of hippie parents. And um, had. And when I say poor, I mean I had no electricity in an outhouse and grew up in a little goat barn for a while, uh, traveled around in a Volkswagen bus, that sort of thing. When I was uh, 15 or so, I was living, I ended up living with my grandparents and um, a, uh, I was visiting my mom uh, during Thanksgiving and a drunk driver hit myself and my grandfather and killed my grandfather next to me. And that kind of put me down a pretty dark path for a while uh, where I turned to uh, drugs and alcohol to kind of, you know, uh, try to cover that up or met, heal that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get sober when I was 17 years old and have been sober ever since. And so that's a big part of my life. Uh, helping other uh, people recover from drugs and alcohol is, uh, is, is a lifelong passion of mine. And uh, around the time I was maybe 23, 24 years old, I found myself in Silicon Valley. And uh, right around the time the internet was discovered or created in 1994, 1993, 1994 area. And I ended up becoming a serial entrepreneur. I started a bunch of website companies, um, chat rooms, and you know different hosting and web design companies. And the biggest company that I built over almost a 20 year career was a company called Friend Finder Networks, which was uh, dating websites that I grew to 600 employees doing $350 million a year in sales. And in 2007, my partner and I sold that company for $500 million. And um, I thought I was gonna retire for a hot minute. <laughs> but that didn't work out. And so I ended up starting another company around my passion for racing cars and collecting cars. And that turned into a uh, Facebook kind of web page uh, setup where I had 25 million fans on Facebook. And that was generating a couple million dollars a year. It was supposed to just be my hobby, but it turned into a thing. So I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good with computers and kind of thinking outside the box. And so that's a little bit of the background of you know who I am and, and what I'm about. And uh, your companies, uh, were you not just the owner, but also the, the manager? So did you uh, oversee a lot of employees? Yeah, so I, yeah, I was in charge of, basically I was on the executive team and we had 600 employees. So they, you know, everybody was basically under me or my partner. Why are you running for president? Well, that's a good question. I, you know, I think a big part of it was that I just kept getting feeling like there was no choices in America, that all my life I was voting for Clinton or Bush, Clinton or Bush. I, I never was a Republican or a Democrat. I, you know, I thought uh, I voted for a guy named Ross Perot early on because he was talking about getting rid of the debt. I talked, I voted for another guy named Ron Paul because he was talking about getting rid of the debt and the, the Federal Reserve. And so I never felt like I was represented. I've never voted for a congressperson in my entire life that has won. So I've never felt like I was represented. And I felt like we have the illusion of choice in America. 
And, you know, I was sort of getting done with um, my work and whatnot and COVID came along and I just, I thought I was watching a lot of business news and and I watched China locking down their citizens. And I thought to myself, thank God I live in America where we would never lock down our citizens, right? <laughs> and, you know, three or four months later, we were all doing the same exact thing. And, and uh, just the tyranny and the authoritarianism, like just was sort of rampant. My friends, uh, you know, were telling me you should run for office. You have a lot of great ideas. You have the time and the resources to do it. And uh, and I was, you know, I had been voting for Libertarian for quite a while at that point. Uh, and I started really kind of researching the Libertarian Party, which I didn't really know about until probably about 2019. Um, I had been voting for Libertarian for quite a long time before that. But, uh, I, you know, I started researching what it would take to run for president. I started really listening to a lot of, you know, more of a deep dive into libertarian ideals and podcasting and that sort of thing. And that was 2019. I filed to run for president in 2021. So I've been running for three years. I saw you at the the Reno convention. I was running then. That's when I met you. Um, and that was two years ago. So I've been actively going at it. You know, I just want to basically... Uh, you know, offer a different choice than what we're getting from the duopoly, which is basically the same thing. They they don't even offer anything different at this point. They just continuously put us into, you know, huge amounts of debt. They um, use the, the authority of government to tell us how to live our lives. And I'm frankly sick of it. And so I want to change that. And I want to be a voice of reason and of uh, common sense in America. How would you describe the libertarian philosophy to a voter who's unfamiliar with libertarianism? Yeah. So I, I often, you know, there's a lot of different ways to describe this, but to me, what it really comes down to is that the common goal, the common purpose of every libertarian person is to reduce the government. That's sort of what I've I've come to the conclusion of. And that you can be left-leaning or right-leaning. And I talk to people about this a lot of times because they say, well, I, I can't be a libertarian because you're a libtard or you're a MAGA who smokes dope. And I say, we're not left or right. We're anti-authoritarian. We're the opposite of authoritarian, we're libertarian, and so I think that as long as you are interested in reducing the state in some way, that in you know pretty much everybody in America has been touched in a negative way by government, uh, whether it's your federal government with taxation or uh, criminal justice or something like that, or local government, your planning department or your DMV or something like that. Everybody has been touched in a negative way, and I think that's the place that we need to start. So liberty to me is just about being able to live my life as I see fit without other people interfering, as long as I'm not harming other people. And I, I love that, you know, don't don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. I think it really is kind of simple like that. It's almost like the golden rule a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. What are your top three issues? And can you talk a bit about each one? Yeah. So for me, it's a lot of it is economic stuff. So I'm a, I really loathe the IRS. So I would love to get rid of the IRS. I think that's a giant waste of time and energy um, for the American people. We waste resources. We waste time. It's literally billions and billions of dollars just wasted every year. And then we make people criminals out of that uh, system, you know, for not p filing a piece of paper on time or in, and, and, and the whole system is just corrupt. It's, it's built to allow for the, you know, executives and the Congress to bro out the corporations um, at our expense, essentially. So I want to get rid of that. Uh, the Federal Reserve is a huge uh, burden to the American people. It's It reduces our standard of living each and every day. It's got a built-in mandate to constantly reduce our standard of living. I can't I can't believe we even let this thing still exist. Um, it's just, it's a form of taxation that we don't even get to vote on. That's not even a government entity. Uh, you know, it's, it's private corporations. And so we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. I think that's a, another big one. And I would say my third one is uh, probably the drug war, ending the failed drug war. It's, uh, it's touched me negatively. Uh, as a sober person, I know that prohibition doesn't work, that I believe that the drug war actually causes more people to use drugs than if we didn't have it because you have cartels um, and their sole purpose in life is to uh, get people to buy more drugs. And so they're, you know, they're doing that and and that causes a lot of people to do, do drugs. So I want to uh, federally deschedule all drugs at the, at the federal level. Is there any plank in the Libertarian Party platform that you disagree with? And if so, which one and why? Yeah, I, no, I, I um, it's funny when I first Googled what is a libertarian in 2007. I think I stumbled across the platform and I'm sure the platform has changed since then, but I think the platform is fine. I, I really think that though, um, 
individual candidates are out there pushing their message and their ideas. And I think that that's almost more important than the libertarian platform, because that's the people that you know, that are going to resonate with local people or or, na or national people. But I think that if we're going to spread the message of liberty, it's going to come from local uh, um, candidates. And so I leave it up to them to decide what, you know, what issues they want to push and what issues they want to champion. How many state conventions have you visited in person and how many of you addressed remotely? And if you don't have like an exact figure, could you give a ballpark? Yeah, I don't know exactly, but I know that I think I'm pretty sure it's been like 35 state conventions. I've done almost every state remotely. Um, I've done a lot of the states that I did conventions for also remotely. So it, it's been a it's quite a significant number of of the states I've covered um, physically. Some some states I wasn't able to cover because you know some states had four or five um, conventions on the same weekend. But on those con those conventions, I often sent one of my uh, team to go speak on my behalf. So we were pretty much at every convention that there was. So let's talk a bit about your campaign infrastructure. Who's your campaign manager? So I I, uh, I have kind of three or four campaign managers, um, and it, they all kind of do different jobs. It's part of my manager style is to have um, a team of people to sort of sound off, and I'm kind of exec executive of the team. But I have uh, Tyler Harris. I have um, uh, Larry Sharp, I have uh, Seth Levy and uh, TJ Ferreira. Those those guys are all uh, top you know top tier level people in my management, and and I use all of them to sound off ideas and kind of come up with the plan that we're going to be doing. Do you have a coordinator in all fifty states? Uh, we have a we have a main coordinator for delegate outreach and for state outreach, and we have regional coordinators for all the regions. I'm not sure if we have air, all 50 states. I haven't been totally up on that, but I know that we have a significant number of them. Um, and I would have to ask my, my person that runs that if I know that we have all 50 states or not. How much money has your campaign raised so far? And how much have you personally contributed to your campaign? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly on raised. I think maybe we've raised about maybe 20 or $30,000. I've mostly because I've been self-funding my campaign. Uh, I just put in another $200,000 into my campaign this week, which I think brings me almost close to the million dollar mark at this point. And I've spent the vast majority of that. So, um, you know, I'm also committing to spend another million dollars of my own capital uh, after the nomination for the presidency. Where can people find out more about your campaign? So website, social media, et cetera. Yeah, Lars24.com is my website, at Libertarian Lars on X. You can find me on Facebook, Lars, just search for Lars for, for president. Um, we have Instagram and TikTok and, you know, other uh, social media things as well, but I don't, I don't push those as much. Uh, if, if you receive the nomination, will you be supporting ballot access with your campaign resources? So trying to get uh, on the ballot in more states? Yeah, 100 percent. So, I mean, one of the main things that I, uh, you know, that I'm trying to do is win electoral votes on election night, which I talked to you about in Reno a little bit. And uh, that led me to Maine, which is one of the states that I'm targeting. And Maine didn't have ballot access when I arrived. They said we don't have it and we're not likely to have it. And so, um, you know, I was able to first I went to Maine and tried to canvas myself. They needed 5000 registered libertarians. The, the libertarians had all been deleted off the voter rolls. And I tried to get registered libertarians, but it turns out registering a libertarian is a lot harder than getting a signature to get a libertarian on the ballot. Uh, and so I quickly realized that I my skill set wasn't going to be able to cut it and that we needed a professional team. Uh, and I got together with the chair of Maine, Harrison Kemp, who is a fantastic chair and really, um, you know, drove drove this mission. Uh, and then I got with Bill Redpath and Richard Winger. Uh, I put in another twenty five thousand dollars of my own money along with the, with those gentlemen and the state and national also put some money in. And we were able to secure major party status for Maine so that they no longer have to get petitions. They can just run candidates, which I think is a pretty awesome thing. Uh, Harrison Kemp is now 
going around to different states to try to do the same thing that he did in Maine, uh, reduce ballot access. He's working with Pat Ford in Rhode Island right now to reduce ballot access there. And I uh, uh, donated to that as well and am supportive of that. And and when I get done with my uh, campaign, I will be funding a nonprofit that will be strictly focused on getting ballot access for the Libertarian Party and reducing ballot access across the land. So I'm very much... Um, active in ballot access issues. Uh, also, Larry Sharp is on my campaign, and obviously he's been, you know, working hard in New York to get ballot access. Um, doesn't look, you know, promising there, but we've certainly been putting in a, a lot of effort around ballot access. Suppose you get the Libertarian Party nomination. Short of getting elected president, do you have any less ambitious goals that we can use as metrics to judge the success of your campaign? So, for example, yeah. you're trying to maximize votes or sell books yeah. or increase party membership or, or yeah. something else. Yeah. So, uh, like I told you, I'm I'm I have a plan that I've put forth called Stop 270, and what it is is that each uh, in order to win the presidency, you have to get 270 electoral votes. If you don't get 270, if no one gets 270 electoral votes, it goes to the House of Representatives under a contingent election, which has happened twice in history. Once was 200 years ago with John Quincy Adams, and the other time was Tom uh, was it Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Jackson, Andrew Jackson. And so essentially I'm focusing on Maine and Nebraska to get these because they have a very small population and they split their electoral vote. So we only have to get 250,000 votes in either Portland, Maine area or Omaha, Nebraska in order to win electoral votes on election night. Um, th this is actually pretty wild. So I went on Shmurkana's show um, uh, maybe about a month ago now and I was talking on Shmurkanish about this Stop 270 plan. And three or four days later, Donald Trump called up the governor of Nebraska and said, I want you to get rid of the split electoral vote. And they, they literally had a House vote on the floor to get rid of the split electoral vote. And unfortunately, it failed. Um, but he said, we need to go back to what the founding fathers envisioned of having winner take all states. And of course, uh, winner take all is a bunch of crap that was, uh, you know, uh, rigging the system so that, you know, states could have more power and that actually it all started out as split electoral votes. But um, so I thought, wow, that's kind of weird that Donald Trump is, you know, going after me there. Uh, but I don't, you know, it was, maybe it's just a coincidence. But uh, a few days later, I got a e email from or actually a call from a guy that was saying, my, my buddy's writing an article about you right now and you need to take a look at it because Larry Ellison is at is doing big donor calls on uh, Trump's super PACs. And they are passing around in a don donor packet that has six pages, a bunch of your polling. And I thought, well, that's kind of wild. And a few days after that, Donald Trump put out on Truth Social one of the polls that I had been pushing, right? So clearly Donald Trump is watching my campaign. Uh, just last week, Donald Trump's team or Donald Trump included me in their internal polling, um, which is just completely wild that they would put me in their own internal polling. So they're clearly watching me. They're clearly, um, you know, see this plan as a threat. Uh, Aaron Burnett was on with Andrew Yang the day after that vote went down in Nebraska, and they were talking about how 269 electoral votes to 269 is totally possible, um, and that the third parties might, you know, be the you know the problem that comes. And I've been talking with Kennedy campaign as well. Uh, I don't think he has a path to 270 electoral votes, but I certainly think he has a path to winning a few electoral votes. And the more that we win combined, the more likely it is to cause this contingent election which would just cause complete chaos in our system. Imagine the uh, the House of Representatives trying to decide who's going to be president of the United States. It took them like weeks and weeks to figure out the Speaker of the House. I think it would be very contentious. And that entire time, they would be talking about how the Libertarian Party completely spoiled the election, broke the election that we, you know, and they and a lot of people would be like, what the hell is a Libertarian? Why, how can they have this much power? They would be Googling what is a Libertarian. And I believe this is the way to get national media attention, double the size of the party and really get the do dollars flowing in. And I'm already causing national media attention with this plan, as you can see, um, by these, you know, by these things. I've been in something like 17 national polls, which is completely unheard of uh, pre-nomination. Wall Street Journal has polled me. Um, the New York Times just polled me. So, um, you know, the, and I'm, I think I paid for, I played for one poll out of something like 16 or 17 polls. So these are all earned media, which I think is pretty fantastic. I've been doing a lot of radio 
and television across the country. So uh, what I'm doing is clearly resonating, and I hope that the delegates vote for me um, to continue with this plan because I think it has real legs. Have you run for office before? Nope. This is the very first time. I, I feel like, though, uh, running for president is very much like running a startup. And I've I've done a lot of very successful startups. You have to put the right team together. You have to get your financing in order. You have to get your messaging in order. Uh, and you have to have a plan. And I have all, put together all of those things. And I think it's running very well right now. Uh, and it, we can execute this plan. When did you realize you were a libertarian? Uh, in 2007, I was on Facebook and I was doing one of those political quizzes and somebody, somebody said, you should take this quiz. And I thought, well, this will be funny because I don't, I've never felt like I was a Republican or a Democrat. I'll do this quiz. And I did the quiz and it said 9090 libertarian. What the hell's a libertarian? <laughs> and so I literally had to Google what's a libertarian, like I told you before. And, and that's when I found the platform and I was reading down and I was like, oh my God, there's people that want to like maintain your gun rights and want to, you know, abolish the drug war and want to, you know, get, you know, criminal justice reform under control and are, uh, fiscally, uh, responsible people that want to abolish the federal reserve and get rid of the income tax all the things that i love uh so i you know that that was my aha moment was probably in 2007 and i've been voting libertarian ever since then i i, I ended up um contributing to my first political campaign ever which was uh one, gary johnson's first run i believe or maybe it was second i can't remember which one i contributed to but and then uh, and then um joe jorgensen and spike as well i contributed to their campaign how long have you been a member of the Libertarian Party? So that's an interesting thing. I think that the Libertarian Party has a messaging problem because I was a Libertarian long before 2007. I just didn't know Libertarians existed. Even though I had voted for Ron Paul, um, I, I still didn't know Libertarians existed. The, the message didn't reach me. And then uh, even once I registered as a Libertarian, I went for... 12 years before I knew that there was a party and that I could belong to something. And believe me, I, you know, I had already sold my company was very successful. There was zero outreach to me in all those 12 years of like, Hey, Lars, you know, you could be part of this party and you could do things. Right. So I literally only learned about it because I was really got more concerned with Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen and was kind of thinking about going to the convention to listen to what they were saying. And that really kind of led me down the path of, oh, there's actually a party and you can do things. Uh, you can, you know, you can be an activist in this as well. So, so that really, I, I, my lifetime member now, Libertarian Party, I think was 2020. Um, I'm also a lifetime member of California. I'm a lifetime member of Texas. I'm a lifetime member of Maine. I'm a lifetime member of Indiana. Um, and then, you know, I've donated quite a bit to states all over the country, um, but some of them didn't have uh, lifetime membership uh, availability. Have you been active in your state and county affiliates? So, yeah, I mean, I've been active in California. Like I said, I'm a lifetime member in California. Um, but when I started running for president, I, you know, I went to some fundraisers here and there, um, attended some events, and I have been to my local affiliate. But in my town, we have two people in my town. So it's, um, you know, I've been a couple of times, but it's not something that's really like super active. And running for president has just taken up 100% of my time to the point where I'm you know, spending my time going from state to state convention as opposed to super local things. But uh, recently I went to a um, a shooting uh, um, thing in Southern California that was put on by the Southern California. I think that it was L.A. Um, L.A. County or L.A. area. And that was pretty fun. So I do I do uh, participate in events in California. Tell us what you do in your first 100 days in office if you were elected president of the United States. Yeah, I hate this question because the chances of getting elected are pretty slim. But uh, the thing is that for me, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna get elected president, we're gonna end up having to have a lot of people elected to Congress as well. It's not gonna be just the president gets elected. If there's a if there's a wave where the president get you know we get we somehow get 270 electoral votes, um, or uh, or the other option, which is we win a couple of electoral votes, send it to the House of Representatives, and the Re House of Representatives picks the Libertarian. That's the two paths that we have. But if we win 270 electoral votes, we are winning a majority or a good chunk of the uh, the Congress as well. So for me, one of the big things I talk about is that 
the president has too much power. So one of the main things that I want to do as president is reduce the power. And how what that looks like is there's a thing called the plum book. The plum book has 7,000 positions that the president gets to fill. I plan on not filling any of those positions, leaving them empty. And if the government isn't functioning properly, then Congress can uh, you know enact those departments and create those departments outside of the um, outside of the president. And so that would be one big thing. And, you know, obviously there would be a lot of vetoing going on with the, you know, uh, the president of no uh, for the Libertarian Party, because if they're coming to me with uh, bloated budgets and you know, expanding government, I'm going to veto it. And at least they're going to have to get two thirds to override me. So that would be a big, uh, th you know, thing in there. And the other thing is, is that. I'm not a big fan of executive orders. I feel like Congress needs to do its job. So I would be going through all the executive orders that are there and uh, likely wiping out a vast majority of them, if not all of them. How should America respond to the conflicts in Ukraine and Israel? Well, we're $34 trillion in debt. So the very first thing is we can't give anybody any more money because we're broke. We're totally broke. What we should be doing is we should be trying to negotiate peace. Uh, I always am on the side of less death. I'm always on the side of more people living. Uh, America muddies its ability to be the peacemaker because we are funding all kinds of people with bombs um, to drop on kids in overseas lands. Uh, it's hard to you know be the trusted peacekeeper if you're the one funding one side or another. So I'm for um, defunding all basically foreign military aid, uh, bringing our troops home, um, get you know closing down the bases around the the. The world, obviously, they're not going to do it all on day one. That'd be economically catastrophic. But as the um, the treaties and the and the bases come up for renegotiation, we'll be you know pulling those troops home and um, reducing our military. I'm for a strong military defense uh, of America, but I'm not for pushing our uh, might around the world or our moral um, uh, compass around the world. Um, we can't police San Francisco and we can't police Chicago. So I'm not exactly sure why we think we can police the rest of the world. So let's rewind a bit to 2019, 2020. Uh, if we had a libertarian in office, how would a libertarian president have dealt with the coronavirus and how should a libertarian deal with a future pandemic? Yeah. So I think what really, the, I think the most catastrophic thing that happened during COVID was that Donald Trump and Cuomo and the Republicans and the Democrats turned the pandemic into a political football. They turned it into a, uh, a reality TV show. And instead of informing the people, which I believe is the is the correct thing to do, is giving the people as much information as they can about what's going on, they you know trotted out these different ex experts that didn't really know what they were doing, would told you, you know, masks are effective, masks are not effective, you should wear three masks, you should, you know, socially distance, you shouldn't socially, like they just had all kinds of rules. They didn't really know what they were talking about. And the uh, the government acted like they were the authority and really knew what they were, what they were saying. And instead, it is my opinion that people could make their own decisions if they were given all the information. So uh, as a president, my goal would be to inform the public of whatever dangers there were, and then let people make their own decisions, what they're going to do with their body, um, with their families, what's best for them and their families. And if that um, is, you know, wearing mask and isolating yourself, then go do it. But I don't think that the government should be in there telling people uh, what to do. We certainly shouldn't shut down our entire economy. You know, <laughs> excuse me, other companies, other countries uh, didn't shut down and they their economies fared much better than ours. Uh, that led to $8 trillion worth of money printing because we completely broke our economy. And then that led to the ridiculous inflation that we've all been experiencing. So the government solution is always um, way worse than the problem that they're trying to fix. And it's that old Harry, Harry Brown saying of the government's really good at breaking your legs and then handing you a crutch and saying, we're here to you know fix it for you. So this will be a video on YouTube, but we're primarily uh, broadcasting live on Twitch, which is a website known for, for gaming. Tell me yep. about your hobbies. Uh, do you play any so, video games or board games <laughs> or card games? Do you like sports or do you have some other hobby that you're passionate about? 
Yeah, I'm actually a huge video game guy. I uh, I play a lot of right now. I play a lot of Fortnite and Overwatch, but I also play a lot of you know old school kind of um, strategy games, that sort of thing. I've been playing video games from the early Pong that you literally had the two dials in the '70s and and played that. I had an Atari. I had you know I've been playing video games my whole life, and uh, I call myself Grandpa Gamer, even though I'm not a grandpa. Um, <laughs> so I I enjoy that. I I'm a surfer. Uh, I like to I like the ocean. I live in santa cruz next to ocean i i like i said i race cars i collect cars i have uh around 50 cars that i enjoy mostly uh 30s 40s and 50s cars um and you know that's i like gardening i like to spend time with my family uh, i have a great you know house and have a good nice garden with a nice backyard full of birds and animals and I enjoy spending time with my wife and my kids and my my parents and that sort of thing so yeah i think uh, it's just kind of a good well-rounded time. I, I enjoy friends. And like I said, one of my passions is also helping people to uh, recover off of drugs and alcohol if they if they have a problem with that. What are your campaign's target demographics? Would your outreach lean conservative, liberal, or some other direction? Are you targeting the young or, or older voters? Or what, where does your campaign lean? Or is it just for everyone? I mean, it is for everyone, but I think what we're, I think the people that we're trying to target right now are the disenfranchised voters, the people who are just completely fed up with the system that don't want to vote anymore, that are like, I can't make any change at all. It's useless. It's pointless. Uh, I think that we need to let these people know that their vote does matter. And I've put forth a thing called the Voters' Bill of Rights to kind of help um, fix our broken election system, give more transparency. You can find that voter's bill of rights on Lars24.com. Uh, and I think it's a really good piece. It's nonpartisan. And so, yeah, we're, we're looking for those people that, you know, are disenfranchised. There's something like 36% or 38% of Americans do not identify as a Republican or Democrat. So there's enough there uh, and the people who aren't voting to win if you if you could get all those people to show up and vote for you. What should the federal government do about climate change? So it's interesting. I was at um, uh, Atlas Forum in New York. I think it's called Atlas Forum. And I was talking to a couple of guys there about our policy to uh, abolish the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and uh, allow for America to, you know, kind of push nuclear energy. Uh, you know, France is the leading country in the world right now for uh least um, carbon emissions. And they're doing that primarily because they have so many nuclear power plants. Uh, so when I was doing that, they these guys said, hey, we have this think tank or this, this group that gets together and talks about uh, environmental solutions, but we uh but we call it free market environmentalism. And I'm like, oh that's interesting because I've always like thought uh libertarian policies maybe didn't work well with uh, fixing, you know, uh, climate problems that might occur or environmental issues that might occur. And they really introduced me this idea of free market environmentalism, which I uh, urge everyone to check out. And it really is essentially just getting regulatory uh, stuff out of the way so that corporations and uh, you know private citizens can find solutions to the problems that we have today that a lot of times were stifled uh, by government who's subsidizing um, you know, oil and gas companies, who's subsidizing uh, solar panels, who's subsidizing you know, God knows what, uh, and, and not letting the market do its thing and find the actual best solution to fixing the problems that we have. So if you were elected president, what kind of judges would you appoint? And do you have a short list for Supreme Court? Yeah, so I think, I, I, you know, I've sort of thought about this, but I don't have a list uh, per se. And, you know, once I win the general, uh, we'll be putting that, you know, to, together a little bit more. But for me, the ideal would be to find people that were kind of hardcore constitutionalists that really believed more in kind of the principles of our founding fathers that believed in limited government that believed in you know keeping government out of our lives so i would be looking for judges that would kind of be you know moving in that direction as opposed to judges who would be really draconian in trying to you know cr create more government uh intrusion in people's lives
So uh, this next question you already touched on a bit, but I'm asking everyone the same question. So we'll see if you want to expand on it. Republicans and Democrats have a large pool to tap to fill the executive branch with appointees. How would you staff your departments? So do you yeah. have anyone in particular in mind for the cabinet level and below? Yeah, so we're not going to appoint anybody. And and if Congress thinks that that needs to be done, then they can then they can create those things. I, I feel like um, that's something like there's, like I said, 7000 positions in the plum book. And under that 7000 is like probably another 50 or 60,000 or more people that are you know directly under the president of the United States. And I feel like uh, that should really you know, we should just not fill that and see what see what breaks and whatever breaks, then we can fix it. But then we'll we'll have gotten rid of a lot of waste. And it's one of these things that I don't need Congress really to um, to do. I just don't fill the positions. And I kind of got that idea actually from Trump because there was a lot of people complaining that the government wasn't functioning the way that it should because Trump hadn't appointed um, you know, these people or whatever. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. I just want to appoint any of them. And that's a way of completely limiting government. And I don't need anybody to sign off on it at all. Uh, so yeah, that's what I would do. How should we handle the debt crisis? Yeah. So, you know, you hear people all the time talk about, well, the only way to get rid of the debt is either raise taxes or uh, low or decrease spending. Right. So um, but you really rarely ever hear people talk about uh, growing our way out of our debt. So vastly increasing our gross domestic product, our GDP. And the plan that I have for that is, and I kind of touched on it earlier, which is uh, abolishing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and really driving down the cost of energy in America. If we were able to reduce cost of energy in America by 50%, pretty much everything that we do would be drastically reduced in cost. That was, this would drive down inflation, uh, and it would allow us to have a lot more revenues, which would allow us to, like, cut or get rid of the taxes altogether and start um, taking down the national debt. Uh, that, and so I think that those are, that's another way that most people don't talk about uh, is increasing our GDP. And that would also drive a lot of new jobs and corporations would come because the energy would be super cheap. Uh, and I believe that uh, also energy independence, which this would achieve is a, uh, security issue, a national security issue. So it also kind of covers a little bit of foreign policy, because if we're, we're um, energy independent, then we won't be fighting overseas for foreign oil, uh, which seems to be like 50% of the stupid wars that we seem to have gotten into my entire life. So I want to get rid of all that too. What should government do about healthcare? Uh, it should stay the hell out of it. <laughs> I mean, that, that, look, I, one of the things I say all the time is government breeds mediocrity and the more government we have, the more mediocre we become. And it's almost, almost, there's no other system that has shown that apparent, um, other than maybe education, like is also a completely mediocre system that the government has like inserted itself into. But the more government has gotten into healthcare, the crappier the services have gotten, the more expensive the services has gotten. Uh, it's the same with education, with all the, you know, with all the student loans and that sort of thing. So government needs to get the hell out of it. Obamacare was just a total mess. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that go to the VA. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a horrible system. So I have on Lars24.com, uh, several pieces of policy that you can look at under healthcare to revise healthcare uh, from health uh, expanded health savings accounts to transparency to re um, enforcing laws that require uh, um, healthcare providers to list their prices up front so you have transparency and there's a bunch of other pieces in there that I think are you know good ways of fixing some of our healthcare problems if you receive the Libertarian Party nomination, do you have a preference for your friend and mate? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I have, um, I'm actually running Larry Sharp as my vice presidential candidate. Uh, he's agreed to run with me. I will not be seeking any vice presidential uh, spot. Uh, I, you know, I'm here to win 270 electoral vote, with, you know, cause this contingent election. If the delegates want me to do that, then that's what I'm going to do. But I don't want to run as anybody else's uh, VP. Larry Sharp is absolutely one of the best messengers in the Libertarian Party. He has a way of being able to talk to regular people, both on the left and the right, uh, in a way that resonates with them and that they understand 
he has very good at empathy and and emotion and tying that into regular folks. So I feel like he is probably the best person that I could have picked to be VP. And I'm super stoked he agreed to uh, run with me. Um, I believe that if I am not the nominee, he will also not be seeking the vice presidential candidacy. Uh, so quick follow up to that. Uh, I, I serve on the bylaws committee. I'm vice chair of the bylaws committee. Um, uh, under our bylaws, uh, Larry Sharp is not eligible to seek the vice presidential nomination because he's, he appears on a petition that's been circulated in New York as a proxy candidate. Um, so do you have a, a plan in place to to change that bylaw or uh, how do you plan to get around that? Yeah, so I think that the spirit of the bylaw uh, is to essentially stop people from, uh, you know, like not hoarding, but like basically keeping the no keeping the nomination for themselves after the fact. Uh, and I don't think that the spirit of the bylaw really works in this particular case. So I believe that if I am the nominee, uh, the delegates will select Larry Sharp as my vice presidential candidate. And if I'm not the nominee, he he's not running for VP, so it doesn't matter. Um, so let's let's get and tackle that when it comes to it. But first I have to win the nomination um, for the presidency. Which former US president did you admire the most? Oof, none. <laughs> like they all sucked. Uh, yeah, no, there's this, there's every president in my lifetime has increased the national debt in their term. Everyone, not one single guy was fiscally responsible. Uh, Clinton had one quarter or something like that where he had a a, surplus, a budget surplus. It wasn't really because he did anything right. It was just timing. Um, so yeah, no, these guys uh, all you know get in wars. They all continue the warfare state. They all continue the taxation regime, the the Federal Reserve. Uh, they every single guy piles on more authoritarianism uh, than the last guy. So yeah, no, I don't back any any previous president. Screw them all. I mean, I'm sure there's ones you know way past my lifetime, but during my lifetime, I don't back any of them. What politician did you admire the most, uh, living or dead? Mm. Um, well. I mean, currently right now, I I think I like Massey. I think he has a lot of interesting things. He, I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's, you know, he's a decent guy. Um, Ron Paul, obviously I voted for him. The thing is, is also like I voted for Ross Perot, but I recently went back and watched a bunch of the videos for Ross Perot. And it, today's Lars Mapstead would not vote for Ross Perot, but, you know, as a child, it, it made sense to me. So I, I think right now, currently, I, I like Massey as uh, as kind of a guy that, you know, champions liberty. I, I, I don't think you're going to get anybody that's going to be 100%, um, you know, to, towards libertarian perfection, but I think he's he's pretty good. Of the prior Libertarian Party presidential campaigns, which most closely resembles the campaign you want to run and why? Hmm. Well, I, I'm a I'm a big fan of Harry Brown, so I would have to say that. And he introduced me to this idea of a government coercion that the, you know the government uses this force to push their um, uh, morals onto others, and that that's a big part of the division that's going on in America today is that we have 49 percent uh, being pushed down by 51 percent, and then it flips by a couple percent, and the other side is getting you know pushed down. And and whenever we have this kind of authoritarian force of telling people how to behave and what they should do with their lives, uh, and they're feeling like kind of helpless, uh, it ends up coming out in ugly ways like the George Floyd riots or the January 6 uh, uh, stuff at the at the Capitol building. Um, and so, yeah, so I think I think Harry Harry Brown would probably be the guy that I would want want to emulate if you could change one government policy and only one what would it be uh policy i mean i think i think it probably have to be taxation it's it's the it's federal reserve getting rid of the federal reserve or taxation would be the the top of my list do you have any endorsements that you're proud of and you want to highlight uh, you know, a number, so it's a little hard. There's a lot of state chairs that back me, but they won't 
publicly announce that they're backing me because they want to stay, you know, neutral. But uh, and I, so I won't name any other names. But uh, I'm proud that I've been, been able to win over a lot of state chairs uh, uh, privately, um, saying that I am their, you know, main pick. And I think that I think that the reason for that, I, you know, there's a lot of people in the party going around these different conventions that are like Lars. I really like you and I want, you know, I want you to be the winner. And the people that I seem to resonate most with are the people who have done the internal workings of the party, who have had to do fundraising, who have had to, you know, execute plans, who have had to work with teams of people. Those people really seem to resonate with me because they see that I actually can get stuff done, that I'm not just talking about doing stuff, but I'm actually going to get stuff done. And, and that resonates with a lot of people, you know, the, you know, I hate to say it, but and I really don't like making money the thing, but in this election cycle, money is going to be the thing. Uh, essentially, we're broke. There's no donors out there. Our Kennedy is uh, sucking all the air out of the room. Uh, you know, the candidates that are running right now, they're all great candidates, but um, that none of them have a plan to do anything different than what we have done for the last 50 years. And because of Kennedy, I expect the results of this election to be under half of 1% for any of the candidates that are running. And I'm the only candidate that has a way of actually breaking out and doing something different by causing this contingent election. And the only way that we can do that is with large amounts of resources, which I'm bringing to the table. What are a few of your favorite libertarian books? Oh boy. Um, I would say I liked, I liked the, uh, the, and the fed book. Um, I liked to, you know, I read several of Harry Brown's books. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a big on some of the, you know, super libertarian literature, but, um, those are a couple that I, that I enjoyed. Um, yeah. Anatomy of the state. Um, another one. Why are you the best candidate to represent the Libertarian Party brand? Well, I think the the answer to that is because I am kind of the most centrist of all the Libertarian candidates. Um, I, I feel like in the Libertarian Party, we have a lot of left-leaning candidates and we have a lot of right-leaning candidates. And the appeal that is, that a lot of people have for me is that I have never seen myself as left or right. And that I feel like I'm very much uh, in the center and I'm very much more towards libertarian than I am towards left or right. And I think that that is what is going to resonate with people um, and will allow me to actually win the nomination because I'm not part of any of the left right factions within the party. Why are you the best candidate to build the libertarian party and build the libertarian movement? Yeah, I think that that it's kind of the same answer, but also that um, I talked about the Libertarian Party has this messaging problem that we aren't reaching out to people, that we aren't introducing the Libertarian Party to people. And with my marketing background, I've literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars on Google ads, on Facebook ads, on Twitter ads. I know how to get the message out to millions and millions of people. I've been buying ads uh, on Twitter. A lot of people, when I'm going around conventions, they're like, I see your ads every day. Uh, I don't want to see any more of them. And that just goes to show that my ads are effective that people are seeing it. And, uh, you know, I think I've reached something like 50 or 60 million ads shown on Twitter, uh, probably, a, probably a similar amount on Facebook since I started running my campaign. I'm still running ads right now. And that is one of the ways that we're going to be reaching a lot of people is through social media marketing, not just not just uh, posting, but actually buying advertising and targeting uh, certain segments and population using uh, big data, uh, L3, L3, L2 data, L2 data. Um, we bought data for uh, several different states already. We've sunk a significant amount of money into that. Um, that allows us to really target the people that we're trying to get um, vote for us. Have you spoken with policy experts at libertarian think tanks? And do you have policy experts advising your campaign directly? Yeah. So that was part of the why I hired Larry Sharp in the first place was to be on my policy team and to help me with public speaking. And we have spent, I think, almost nine months, uh, two times a week for nine months writing policy. And we boiled that down to the 37 pieces of policy that are on my website. We have white papers. It's not just like one liners of like, here's what we're going to do, but we actually have a plan um, to do them. And we thought very carefully about 
the ones that we championed because we wanted to have them be actually achievable. Uh, so we've really put a lot in there. We brought in experts on almost every piece of policy. Uh, we probably had 20, 20 plus experts out of 37 pieces of policy that came in. Um, and so it's it's very robust and and very deep on our policy. That's, uh, in, if there's one thing a lot of people say that I kind of went overboard on policy, um, maybe I focused too much on it, but it, it's, it's something that we put a lot of effort into. And I'm really proud of that, especially the Voters' Bill of Rights. If you've received the nomination, will you campaign full time for the general election? Yes, 100%. Uh, we are right now we're talking about doing not only a 50 state campaign because we want to make sure that we cover all the states um, and all the candidates who are running in all the states, but that we're also going to be putting time into Maine and Nebraska. Um, we have field teams already set up in Maine and Nebraska. We're getting Airbnb set up there um, so that we can start hit the ground running literally next week after the nomination. I'm ready to go. My team's ready to go. Uh, I just need the Libertarian Party to put me to work. Uh, you kind of addressed my next question, but I, I ask everyone the same question, so I'll ask it in case you want to expand. What kind of campaign will you run? Will you travel a lot to speaking events or run a media-focused campaign? Will you campaign with down-ticket Libertarian Party candidates? Yeah. So I think, you know, the main, there's three main things for the president to do. One is to get the libertarian message out there, uh, grow the party and fundraising is, is a huge piece of it. And the other piece that's really critical, I think, is making sure that down ballot candidates get attention. Um, and, and especially in the, um, races that are winnable, we should be spending a lot of energy as president in those states. One, one, uh, candidate that I'm really excited about. I, there's a number that I am, but uh, Michael White in in Arkansas. I'm really excited about uh, Fina uh, Banoa in uh, in Florida. I'm excited about. There was a number of people that I met in Texas that seemed very capable. Um, and so, and I know North Carolina and and Indiana and Illinois are all running a lot of candidates. So uh, I'm going to be putting a lot of time in into all states, um, helping support down ballot candidates, fundraising, um, and doing the massive. Uh, social uh, media push that I talked about. We've had some previous uh, candidates for president and vice president uh, on our ticket that within a few years have left the Libertarian Party. Uh, will you remain in the Libertarian Party far in the future, whether you win or lose the nomination? Yeah, I, I hope that I do. Uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly what you know what changes the Libertarian Party would undergo, you know, in the future. But as as it currently stands, I look forward to participating. I found three businesses that I'd like to start uh, after this, which is um, one is a polling company. After being myself in like seventeen polls, none none of the other candidates are really polling. Uh, uh, maybe one or two have gotten a, a poll or two, um, but a polling company would allow us to put candidates all over the country into the polls. And let's face it, if you're not in the polls, you don't exist in the media. So so right now, uh, with those 17 polls, the media thinks I'm the de facto uh, libertarian candidate right now, which is you know interesting. Uh, and then the other thing is Libertarian Party sucks at fundraising. We have no infrastructure. We have no ability to fundraise for our candidates. Each one has to reinvent the wheel every time. So I'd like to build a uh, competitor to act blue and win red that would be something like go gold for the Libertarian Party to really be able to drive fundraising. And thirdly, the thing that I talked about with Harrison Kemp, uh, reducing ballot access. Uh, across states, because if we could reduce the cost of ballot access um, across many states, the dividends over the years would be amazing, and we would have a lot more resources to be uh, trying to win um, campaigns and with candidates around the country. That's great. Uh, so that ends the list of questions that I had. Uh, I do have one question for the audience here. Uh, so uh, the audience question is about the military industrial complex. Uh, so you, you mentioned, as far as foreign policy, that uh, you don't want to pursue an interventionist foreign policy. W what about uh, the corporations in the U.S.? Would you put more pressure on them to stop involving themselves in wars and selling weaponry to, f to fuel those wars to other countries? Mm. Um, well, I certainly don't think that as a taxpayer, I don't want any of my money going to those corporations to fund bombs to drop on kids in faraway lands. There, after I sold my company for $500 million, you can imagine I had a hefty 
hefty tax bill. And it just so happens that that year um, or a year or two later, uh, we I woke up one morning and it said we were in in the uh, in the in the uh, in the Gulf area, and we were shooting cruise missiles at some country. I don't know if it was Syria or something. And and they shot ten cruise missiles, and they were a million dollars each. <laughs> and uh, three of the missiles were duds, and they fell in the sea. And I thought, you know, it's just my it'd just be my luck that the three missiles that fell in the sea were the million dollars that they just took me from me um, for, through taxation. And I was like, uh, you know, I don't know whether to laugh or cry that they're just burning money to the ground like that. And after all the hard work that I did, and that is the same for every citizen in America, whether you made 50 bucks or a hundred bucks, the government takes your money and then just completely burns it to the freaking ground. Uh, and that has to stop. And especially it has to stop when they're burning it to the ground to kill other people. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in dc i'll be flying there tomorrow and i'm sure you'll be flying in uh, shortly Me too. <laughs> um do, do you have uh any uh final words you want to give to wrap up to the audience here uh do you sure. want to plug your uh, website again for example yeah Lar lars 24 uh lars24.com uh, at libertarian lars on x twitter uh, and lars for president on facebook look if you're a delegate and you're coming to dc i need your vote i can do this thing I, I can actually win this contingent election and cause it go to the House of Representatives, but I need you to help me. Uh, if we, if you don't nominate me, then you're going to be getting half of a percent or less again. And if you're willing to settle for that, then you know, vote for somebody else. But I'm the only guy that's going to pull it together and make it through the end. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in DC. Thanks. Uh, have a great night.